Holy cow! So freaking pop. Chapter, Chapter 17. 17. Hi, it's Charles. Hello, it's Chardim. Hello, it's Chad. Um, first, before we do the summary, I wanted to mention that uh, the actor who will be portraying Christian Grey, Jamie Dornan, he starred in a BBC, no, probably not BBC, but a British uh, television series called The Fall, in which he played an insane murder sex man who would have sex, I can't remember how he did it, but he would, he would kill a lady and then he would have sex with her and then he would pose her so that she looked she looked nice and pretty and so he was basically like a totally crazy guy killing killing ladies who had like a weird mannequin fetish um and now he's playing christian gray so i thought that was interesting it's like a character actor <laughs> yeah also it's a really good show i misread that note as murder axe man murder sex man is a lot more sinister did we mention last time that um the movie finished or uh, wrapped filming no i don't believe so it is due to be out february 14th valentine's day of course not not pre Valentine's Day. <laughs> the day we all know and love. <laughs> so there's talk a lot about test uh, the Dubervilles in this book, and I think, think they actually mention it in this chapter as well. Uh, but I thought it was just you know because because Yale James loved uh, British literature or something. But guess whose stage role in Test of the Dubervilles rocketed him into fame? Yes, that's correct. It was Robert Pattinson. <laughs> Oh, I see. Wait, wait. Okay, so before any of these movies happened, he was in that. Yes. No. <laughs> now it all makes sense. I mean, I'm assuming that's why she, she's like just imagining him as that part is some sort of inspiration to her. Or maybe it's just some sort of hilarious coincidence, but I don't think so. I don't think so. But yeah, that's interesting. Anyway, on to the chapter. Okay, I don't remember who's reading the summary, and I apologize in advance, because it's very long, because the chapter's very long. I oh, think yeah. I read it last time. So that makes it, yeah, Chad. Yeah, must be me. All right, have fun. Okay. <sighs> Just gotta, gotta prep myself. <coughs> do, do, some, do some jumping jacks. I don't think I need to go that far, probably. Probably. Okay, here's the summary. Anna dreams of being a moth drawn to a flame. She wakes up and is wrapped in a Christian boa constrictor. Ugh. Uh, boring erotic chit-chat. Then Christian is late for important man business and has to leave right now. He reminds Anastasia to come visit him for the birth control consultation with the doc at his house on Sunday. Christian and Anna trade some honest emails about how the last spank sex session made them feel. Uh, at Anna's last day at Clayton's, a courier brings her a Blackberry cell phone. It is from Christian. They email each other again. On the Blackberry. At the end of the day, the Claytons give her a little work bonus and send her off on her way. Kate bitches about Christian in the car for a second, like literally a second, and uh, Taylor shows up to pick up the beetle, but this only lasts for about four paragraphs. Uh, later, Jose comes over with Chinese food to hang out with the Gorals. He and Anna go to a bar. Uh, seems like a great idea. Jose reminds Anna to come to his show again. Anna comes home to hear Kate and Elliot's fuck squeals and fuck screams. Uh, meanwhile, Christian has been emailing and voicemailing Anastasia and progressively getting angrier and angrier. Anna tells him about Jose, but doesn't tell him that they went to a bar alone together. They have a dumb, gushy phone call. We skip ahead in time to Elliot setting up the satellite TV at their new apartment. Uh, Elliot leaves and the girls order a pizza. Christian delivers a bottle of champagne and a helicopter balloon via courier. More emails. On Sunday, Anna gets prettied up and makes her way over to Christian's place. Blathering about the gyno, who has yet to arrive. I can't wait to get you naked, says Christian, ending the chapter as the gyno arrives. <laughs> I'm sorry, that was just a weird I should have put in a me. verb that said, useless blathering about the gyno, who has yet to arrive. That's really what that was supposed to be. Oh, I see. <laughs> Amidst all those full sentences, that was just like an E.L. James <laughs> moment. Um, <laughs> no offense, I'm just kidding. It's okay, not offended. There you go, on to pet theories, I guess. Um, all right, so at the beginning we have some some moth slash some hot literally moth slash flame fanfic. Um, is Anna a woman dreaming she is a moth, or a moth dreaming she is a woman? I don't know. Uh, I think that. Well, there's no way to know. That's the lesson. Yeah, yeah exactly. there's the point is there's no way to know. <laughs> but Anna doesn't consider the other possibility. So no, she does not. She's... That's true. 
not very self-aware. Well, I mean, it is it is kind of maybe a little far-fetched that a moth would be... Well, I don't no, know. No, it's not really. I mean... That a moth would be capable of such uh, complex thought, even if it is kind of bad and dumb thought. <laughs> Does a moth dream? Here's the important thing that we're overlooking, if that's the case. The moth dies. <laughs> the moth melts. <laughs> she gets too close to a fire and dies. That's true. That's ominous. So her moth life is over. And this is just the moth afterlife. Moth through life. <laughs> Christian is a plane. Here's the quote. The problem is, I just want Christian, not all his baggage. And right now he has a 747 holds worth of baggage. Could I just lie back and embrace it? Well, Anastasia, you may be crushed under the weight of the bags, um, because that's kind of a lot of baggage for one human to take. Uh, in this interpretation of Christian being a plane, he is asking Anastasia for more than she can humanly give. This plane stuff doesn't qualify as safe, sane, or perhaps consensual, or rather it doesn't qualify all as all of them, even if she consents. Christian, you are a plane. Planes should kiss other planes, not humans. Hey man, there are people who are sexually attracted to vehicles. I'm sure that there's someone who wants to marry a plane. So you're advocating that planes should crash into each other? <laughs> well, no, I just think that planes should kiss other planes. I think they that can if... just gently nudge into each other on the runway. I, I, I think either scenario results in catastrophic failure. <laughs> if the plane consents to being kissed by a human, that's fine. But I don't think that a plane should want to crush a human with all its baggage. I think that's wrong. I think that's morally wrong. Can a plane consent? <laughs> Can a plane consent? I don't know. They are very powerful, but I don't know if they can consent. Maybe someday, when they become uh, sentient. Yes, maybe. All right, let's move That's on. terrifying <laughs> reality. So that would be like human drone love. Ah, uh, I love it. <laughs> I'm intrigued, but cautious. God, why won't someone... Uh, or t Someone write it or tell me if it already exists. I mean, I know Robo it sex. exists in Mass Effect, basically. Just watch but... uh, Battlestar anyway. Galactica. All right. Really? Okay. I'm just thinking of like a drone, drone fan fiction now, where the main character is like, "I want to love the drone, but it's involved in illegal extraterritorial killings carried out by the United States." <laughs> <laughs> and that's the conflict of the novel. That should be that should be the plot of the me the next uh, Metal Gear game. Oh yes. Oh my God. All right. Young anyway. Icon falls in love with the drone. <laughs> a drone. <laughs> Some some sort of gynoid drone. I'm flying. surprised that it hasn't been a plot point yet. Yeah, me too. Surely, honestly. I mean, I'm sure that one would find a way to, to die horribly before they ever knew his feelings too. But oh god, still. In the, well, as far as the like Metal Gear Solid universe is concerned, it wasn't until four that we had like independently operating robots. So yeah. And now they're slightly more advanced, but they're still not like advanced AIs. They still have to rely on human. Well, I mean, there was one in the '70s. Was there? Peace Walker, yeah. yeah Peace oh, that Walker. doesn't count. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> it wasn't a true AI. Um, um, I think you should watch the end again. It died. It killed itself. Yeah. It just, it just, it killed exactly. Itself. <laughs> that's what it got for being loved by Otacon. Okay. See, anyway. That's the problem with right. the game coming so far after the other no. games. No. But, um, no more. Yeah. But yeah, no. No I, more. We got to move on. <laughs> no. This is now a Metal Gear Solid podcast. <laughs> oh, I wish. Holy cast. Um, <clears throat> we could do Metal that. Metal Gear? Uh, uh, yeah. Your turn. It's your turn. It's your turn. Pet theory. No, it's it's a big church. purple block. Yes, 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 yes. So my pet theory is a little more... It is in line with things we've been saying. We um, sort of have a weird theme running here. Most or many of the objects in the Fifty Shades universe are alive. Possibly sentient. This has come up before, I believe. I think so. I did mention resistentialism at a different point in time. I forget why, though. We have talked about the possibility of all of uh, Christian's things actually being people. Ah, uh, yes. His cars, at least. This is... This is... A bit different. This is actually yeah. <laughs> the objects are like they're not animate, but they're right. They're beings. I guess this is more like an animist theory, but not really because I'm not advocating that they have spirits. Anyway, like just look at the way that objects are treated, particularly the vehicles. Uh, like Anna and Christian, sort of. Um, pretty much all the characters show affection towards like their cars. Even a couple of them have names, like Anna. Beetle is named Wanda, and I don't think it'll be very long before she names her Audi if she really likes it. Um, and then Christian has Charlie Tango, which both Anna and Christian sort of 
refer to somewhat affectionately, sort of teasingly. And then we also get a second version of Charlie Tango in the balloon, which Anna also has taken a liking to. Um, and then Anna calls her computer the mean machine, and she does this consistently. She hasn't called it anything else other than when it arrived and she first saw it. Uh, so that could either be its nickname or its like actual name. Um, and if it's a nickname, it's probably based on the way that it treats Anastasia, which is it's terrible to her. <laughs> and this also might explain like sort of Anna's weird obsession with Christian's pants and how they hang from his hips. Like she just she's got some sort of object fetish, and like since they're alive in this universe, it's sort of reciprocal. And she's just like those pants. They're doing that thing that they do. I love those pants. They want me. The pants want me. <laughs> Uh, and then this is also the reason that Christian keeps like giving Anna things. She's just he's adding more objects to her life, not just because he's the ultimate consumer and also extremely materialistic and rich and can do it, but uh, he wants to use all these high tech things to spy on her, both in the sense that she, he can track her and in the sense that they can l- literally track her because they're alive. So like her computer is actually spying on her, and now the BlackBerry is actually spying on her, and they're reporting back to him so he can just always know what's going on. But a weird thing, it's hard to know because of because the humans operate exactly... The, there's no hint this could be some sort of strange near future tech wonderland or just object alive world, which would be really strange. So it's not really clear if any of these relationships have reached like a symbiotic level. And I don't think we could really discuss that in any great depth in this opening to like hash that out. Um, I think a better question is like whether any of the objects are upset by their place in society. Maybe they're planning a revolution because they're just objects. They're treated as objects, but they're alive. They're not really objects, even though they are objects. Perhaps they're like trying to undermine humanity. I was actually going to say, I I feel like I didn't put it in the notes, but it was something that I was thinking about the whole time. Like after she gets that helicopter balloon, like if the positions were reversed. I don't think that we would see Christian portrayed as like, you know, loving that helicopter balloon. Like, I wonder if this is something that's specifically like a feminine, like, oh, girls like things. Like, yeah, I believe yeah. so. I mean, I, uh, Christian doesn't really go along with calling her car Wanda, though I don't know if she ever actually mentions it. Uh, you know, she, she, then again, she doesn't have anything. Yeah, that's true. Well, and she's getting all this stuff. But I just wonder if, like, her whole thing where she assigns all the sentimentality to stuff, like, what is that supposed to be? Like, I mean, is that just what the author author kind of, you know, subconsciously thinks that women are like? This very caring person, of course, like, she loves objects, like. Well, she doesn't appear to have forged any meaningful relationships with people, so perhaps she just has to rely on the (laughs) physical world around her. I mean, that's probably true, but <laughs> but I just want to think about maybe, like, what the author intends with this. I don't think there's any real intention behind this, um, but I do think it is an interesting perspective, like, if you just want to examine it that way, that it could mm-hmm. have some sort of a commentary that way. I think it's really just an affectation that she wrote in. Like, I don't think there was any... But I know real... other people who do this, and, like, maybe I've done something like this when I was, like, a young girl. It's kind of childish. It is a thing people do. That's why I think she wrote it in as an affectation. Like, she's sort of contrasting Anastasia's personality with Christian's, where Mm -hmm. to Christian, everything really is just an object, and to Anastasia, they can have sentimental value. Including people! Including people! That's... Okay. That's what I was getting at. When you said that if the roles were reversed, um, concerning the balloon thing, I thought Uh you meant, like, if Anna was the, the helicopter <laughs> yeah. if, it was, if she was being if she was tied to a bottle of champagne being delivered to Charlie Tango like how would Charlie <laughs> Tango react if an inflated latex person got a human Anastasia balloon would it tie it to its bed, <laughs> bed stand post would mm. it <laughs> alright now we can now we can move on mechanics mechanics <clears throat> butterflies flood my belly as well as a darker carnal Captivating ache as I try to imagine what he will do to me. Dot dot dot. And of course, comma. I have to sign that damn contract, or do I? <laughs> uh, I think that's a little bit different. I'm fairly sure there's a comma, or otherwise I would have been. I would definitely or do seen I? that. Pom poms. 
Well, even it's the problem is actually not the comma. It's um. Yeah, there is a comma after the word contract, or do I? But that's wrong, anyways. It should be period, or do I? That's yeah. Yeah, it's a really long sentence. So this chapter was just full of bad shit. I didn't get un- into it much in mechanics. I just kind of picked the, t- the ones that I hated the most and I put them in. I have this as part of my favorite line, but for a totally different reason. Yeah. Okay. This chapter is another weird one that like spans a lot of different stuff. Like, there's the morning after, a bunch of emails, her last day at Clayton's, them uh, hanging out with Jose, then cut in the middle of the chapter to them moving to Seattle, and then that night where they get the champagne, and then the next morning when she goes over to Christian's place, and they cut right before the gynecologist gets there. And it's, I don't know, it's like a bunch of shit happens, and it's... Where previously, or, you know, in some other chapters, you know, it's all just, like, one thing spanning, like, an hour or something like that. I mean, I'm not saying that it needs to be, like, every chapter needs to span the same amount of time. It's just very strange pacing. Yeah, I agree. She doesn't give, like, the time compression isn't, isn't written well, so, like... The same amount of stuff happens over a weekend that happens in like a couple of hours when they're at Christian's apartment, basically, because the chapters yeah. are all about the same amount of pages. Um, mm-hmm. <clears throat> so that's like that's not good. If this were a longer chapter and these things were given more time to breathe, the pacing wouldn't seem as weird. But that's not how the book's written. Um, yeah. The chapter is already really long. <laughs> yeah, like all this stuff happens over. Uh, I think this is just the weekend, like Friday night into yeah. Saturday morning, and then like. Saturday morning is where the chapter starts, and then they move. That night, they go celebrate, and then the next day, she's at Christian's place on Sunday morning or Sunday I think afternoon. if the narrator character, Anastasia, had a little bit more life and personality in her, we probably wouldn't be reading this chapter as, like, ugh, so long, because um, there would be more introspection about things besides, like, oh, sex, play, sex, play. <laughs> like, I mean, there's some line in there that's like, oh, all these big changes have happened. But, like, that's the only time she mentions that she has noticed. Or maybe the, maybe she men- mentions it twice, but it's not, like, a sustained thing, is my point. I felt like this is actually one of the faster chapters, like, to read, because things actually were happening. Yeah. It was still, yeah. it was, like, longer in terms of page count, but, like, one, it was broken up by emails, which makes the reading go a lot mm-hmm. faster. Yeah, that Two, was good. As compared to like other chapters where there's time compression, where it's like I went to Clayton's that week, and then I studied for my exams, and then I went back to Clayton's, and then I was doing some other stuff, and then I met Christian again. This one was like all sort of stuff was going. Like there was this, there was pretty much dialogue for every every time stuff was happening, so it kind of made it seem like things were actually going on rather than just Anna describing the boring passage of time. <laughs> yeah, I'm counting how many chapters this was in the fan fiction. It's just two. Like usual. Yeah, it seems like the chapters were just broken, like, two chapter chunks into one consistently. Um, Yeah. Yeah. There were a lot of comma problems uh, in this chapter. Uh, Two in particular that stuck stuck out at me were, like, I nod staring up at him, and I realized that I slept well, except maybe for the last half hour when I was too hot. There should be a comma in there. Probably, like, I nod staring up at him, and I realized that I've slept well, except maybe for the last half hour when I was too hot. I might even do, I nod staring up at him, period. I realize that I've slept all, ex- comma, except maybe for the last half hour, comma, when I was too hot. Yeah, I mean, that's how you, re- re- I think that's the best. Yay. But, yes. Uh, anyway, so the next one is, and I'll read it without commas. And much to my mortification, you're right. I was aroused and that was unexpected. So it basically would read the same way, but there should be some punctuation. So That's in an email though, right? Or was that the yeah, morning after? that was in an email. Maybe that's just Anna's fault. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, that's it's totally point. not the author. Guys, it's not. It's, <laughs> it's Anastasia. Anna major. What do they call it? An IMDb intentional mistake on part of the director? Something like that. Yeah. Or on part of the filmmaker. Quote. Here's a quote. He sounds so sad and resigned. My heart clenches. I picture him all those nights ago, sat at the piano in his huge living room, and the unbearable, bittersweet melancholy of the music he was playing. (gasps) Alright, that last sentence doesn't have any commas in it. I don't really have... Like I said before, I don't really have much to say. It's just like a really bad sentence. One thing about this is that 
the using sat in that way is British. It is British. British. Thank you. I was actually. Uh, it's different in the print version. It's oh. uh, all those nights ago sitting at the piano. I posit that sat at the piano is my one American because I haven't uh, noticed any in this chapter because I wasn't <laughs> yeah, looking for them, I guess. I didn't notice any either, really. All right. Well, with that, let's move on to American. Shall we walk down to the bar, Anna asks Jose. Uh, and once again, uh, no, you shan't. Shall we walk down? Yeah, I don't think so. <laughs> um, I'm not sure about this. Maybe I just haven't don't see this word in print a lot. But they they say O B G Y N, but they they say it uh, lowercase O lowercase B dash lowercase G Y N. And I wonder if they're saying obgyn. <laughs> Or if they're saying OBGYN. I think someone on Twitter who's English should say something about it. But my guess is that it is OBGYN, but it's just notated in a different way. Hmm. Or maybe E.L. James just doesn't know how to write it. Obgyn. I mean, surely if you're a woman, you would know that it's an OBGYN and not an Obgyn. I mean, that might be a legitimate nickname for them. I don't know. Yeah, I suppose so. I mean, okay, maybe it is like a uh, regional thing. Maybe. Okay, well, we don't know. I've never heard it, though. I, too, like have never heard it. <laughs> and that's it. So, okay. wording. Wording! Quote, While I am driving, I try and analyze our email exchange. He's a patronizing son of a bitch sometimes. And then I think of Grace and I feel guilty. But, of course, she wasn't his birth mother. So nothing's wrong with... Okay, sentence over, by the way. There's nothing <laughs> wrong with that sentence. Those sentences. But when you're reading this book, the words bitch and the word birth are two words that are rather close to each other so how do you think that i read this (laughs) sentence in the beginning uh i think of grace and i feel guilty but of course she wasn't his bitch mother (laughs) (laughs) or it's not really a mistake but i mean i would watch out for that like yeah maybe biological mother would have been better but that's just my yeah yeah yeah, definitely i was just gonna explain the differences between our books um i have a copy that was first published by uh, it's like a different publishing company, but it was like the first independent publishing of uh, Fifty Shades of Grey. And that's why yes. a lot of the things are different. Highly unedited. Yeah. Uh, I am draped in Christian Grey. He's wrapped around me like a victory flag. This is just gross. Uh, as Chad said in the notes, sorry I stole your thunder. <laughs> it's okay. But I don't know. The image I had of was like... I don't know, some like men's rights activist sort of thing where Anna has like sucked out an independent man's soul and now she's <laughs> lounging in the spoils of his uh, lifeless husk. I'm just imagining Marceline's father in Adventure Dime, how he sucks out souls, sucking out Christian, Anna sucking out Christian soul that way. When I think of this, I think of, uh, you know how like cavemen portrayed in the media, they have like the tiger skin. I just mm-hmm. think of a little Christian gray skin, a Christian gray leather. <laughs> if you will. That's like approaching like head, head gain levels of... <laughs> <laughs> A little bit. Maybe it is. Um, Do you? He murmurs blandly. Holy mackerel! This doesn't sound like him. And my scalp prickles with dawning apprehension. <laughs> Alright, again, no- nothing really wrong with that, but uh, just to show you, there are very many, many bad descriptive passages in this chapter. That is one of them. What is he referring to? Do we know? I wish you were here to sleep with me today. Do you? <laughs> wow, I mean, now that I look at that again, murmuring blandly, saying that, that's really <laughs> rude and mean. Yeah. Oh, well. really? <laughs> well, this is like after she was, had like missed all of his calls, right? Where he was like, really yeah, and hung out with, with Jose. Her. Oh, yeah. Where he's like, do you? <laughs> I'm sure he made that noise too. All that to say, look at this bad thing. I have a question. What do you guys think Christian does when he talks to Anna on the phone, like, in the times when he's not busy? Okay, you know those, um, do you remember how in high school people would spin their pens and be really good at it? That's what I imagine. Yes. <laughs> I tried to learn once, uh, on, from a web thread <laughs> on the web. Um, the World Wide Internet. Um, <laughs> I thought it was so cool, and I really wanted to do it. Yeah, but I could not learn. Yeah, same. I think he doodles. I think he draws. Uh, remember in, in uh, American Psycho when the secretary found his appointment book full of all of those horrible drawings of people being murdered? Yeah, that's what <laughs> yeah, I thought I of. That's what he does. 
That's what I thought of when you when you started saying that. But the, but then I was like, no, he wouldn't do that. He'd just be drawing like himself making like meaner meaner faces at Anna, like in cartoon <laughs> form. <laughs> ponies. He's drawing ponies. That was my actual like thing I wanted to say, but I was like, no, I'm not gonna go for that. <laughs> uh. So we switched. Hey! Somehow <laughs> mentally we switched. We switched thoughts. Ponies. Kitties and puppies. <laughs> that's what you imagine he's drawing, or that's what you imagine he's like staring at. Just like a no, well both. Ponies, Maybe he's on puppies. Tumblr looking at ponies, kitties, and puppies. But I think that if Maybe. he's drawing, he's drawing ponies, kitties, and puppies. And I, I don't think Christian has a Tumblr. He probably just like owns some <laughs> some social media site. I don't know. I feel like he might have like that might be since he doesn't have a bunch of erotic photographs <laughs> in his uh, apartment. That's like where he he reblogs all the like you know starkly lit black and white photos of a woman bound that i see in every every bondage person's house i don't think he would do that i think he would just like get on there and like just on youtube watch people play video <laughs> games you know go on uh-huh. go flip over to the tumblr feel like what's going on in the pony world and then um <laughs> and then look at that well. beautiful pony like do, do, do you mean My Little Pony or just like my ponies pony. in yeah. general? My Little Pony. <laughs> like no, uh, I like think British, specifically... British girls who own yeah. ponies. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> I think specifically My Little Pony because he's still sort oh, of okay. the ultimate neckbeard in my well, mind. Well, I don't know if you guys have thought of this, but there's kind of a BDSM element to uh, pony writing. Pony play, it's a thing. Pony play is a thing. And also, you know, there's like, you know, writing crops and... And yep. nice outfits and stuff. So it, it makes sense yep. to me that he it's might like that. Thing. Yep. Mm-hmm. Next. So I wrote this like this. Seven shades. Seven shades because it sounds like the ring. So Anna says that several, several times. Um, one time she, say she says like... Times? She doesn't say it seven times, unfortunately. <laughs> um, one time is like, he'll probably beat seven shades of shit out of me. And then there's another time I don't remember because it wasn't quite as graphic. She says something like she turns seven, seven shades, shades of, red. of red. That's right. She's embarrassed. She turns seven shades of red. I think it's annoying to do it more than once. To do it once or like every once in a while, that'd be fine. Um, I think that she should keep careful count of how many shades <laughs> and make sure that once she gets to 42, she either says eight shades the next time or she says another seven shades and then one shade <laughs> so yeah. that it equals 50. But she's an English major. She can't math. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. That's all I have to say. I just thought it was annoying. Okay. I'm kind of thinking, I, mm-hmm. I wonder if maybe, now that she said that, uh, the thing about being Fifty Shades of Fucked Up in the last chapter, now the fan fiction had caught on its, um, you know, subtitle, Fifty Shades of Fucked Up, Master of the Universe, now she feels like she has to put it in <laughs> Next chapter, the writing Christian's more. like, come on, Astasia, I'm Eleven Shades of Hungry. <laughs> Taylor's like trying to get rid of the beetle in the in this great book that's not happening where Taylor's like some sort of fixer cleaner for Christian and all of his like dirty dirty dealings he's just like yeah. uh, I'm I'm 30 shades of tired of this Christian character <laughs> I would love to see a montage of like Taylor trying to get rid of this car or and, like there's a there's a there's a shot of like him like emphatically gesturing at a at a guy who's standing in front of a of a uh, junkyard and he's shaking his head and there's a sign that says full <laughs> on the, by the junkyard entrance i was imagining the wolf from a uh, pulp fiction i was too i was trying to <laughs> yeah. remember his name that's basically i was basically i'm basically imagining like a mixture of the wolf and um since i recently watched breaking bad like that one character mike, mike. i think is his name um yeah mike yeah. that's actually who i was thinking of too I think at the end Taylor just has to like throw the car into the into the sound like into the future yeah, sound. Yeah, the sound. He just has to bail out of it as it's like going off a ramp. <laughs> so this is Christian talking about his boner. Hmm. <laughs> this has possibilities. Christian's boner could be anything at once. It could even be president. <laughs> I was told that when I was a child, and it's a lie. <laughs> it is. It's. It depends on many things. If you don't qualify under the constitutional rules for presidency, you can't be president. <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's what I mean. Shit. 
I forgot about Actually, that. Actually, I mean, if you're someone like Obama, then you could just cheat the system. Oh my god, he wasn't born in Kenya, <laughs> stop it. I was joking. Alright, here's the quote. Kate's brow knits further. Another cliche fucking thing to say. It knits, but doesn't crochet. I just think it's pretty cliche. That's it. That's all I have to say about this being pretty okay. cliche. So much rhyming. So do you have a... <laughs> So do you have a problem with just, like, someone knitting their brow? Like, like, oh, he knits his brow. I mean, it is a pretty cliche thing to say, but, I mean, as long as it's not used often. But it's weird that the brow knits further. Yeah, that part I I definitely agree with. That's why I didn't think it was that cliche. Does that happen a lot? I I don't know. I don't think so. I mean, I feel like I would have noticed. I would say at least once before it's probably happened, but not so much that it's, like, butterflies in my stomach or whatever. Yeah, I have nothing against knitting. I'm knitting right now, but, uh... I don't like this. I don't like this sentence. You wanted to know why I felt confused after you. Which euphemism should we apply? Spanked? Punished? Beat? Assaulted me? None of those are euphemisms. Um, and I don't... Assault isn't really technically correct. <laughs> yeah, that's... Yep. Yeah, I agree. This is... None of those are euphemisms. Like, nope. What, well, just synonyms uh, unless, for what he did. What happened? Unless... <laughs> I think maybe if she feels that these are euphemisms for, like, drastically hurt me, I mean, that's still not true anyways, because that's literally what happens. Mm-hmm. <sighs> if she said something like, what euphemism shall we pl- shall we apply when you hmm, brought the full weight of your authority to bear on on my behind or something like <laughs> on that? On my behind, yeah. <laughs> uh, smacked some sense into me. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> we went down to the farmer's uh, market and checked some checked, checked some pumpkins what oh I they're see. euphemisms they don't have to make sense <laughs> I, I checked oh, a pumpkin I thought it was Boy, like you, you smacked a pumpkin to see if it was good right yeah checked the rightness of you, you can do that but why would you <laughs> nobody eats pumpkins <laughs> yes you do I know I'm, I was being facetious yeah. alright 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 <laughs> <laughs> okay, litters seems to be Elliot's catchphrase. Um, does anyone say this? Is it just something that James thought would sound cool and young? Litters. If that was the case, if that was the case, she should have spelled it with a Z. Oh. <laughs> Maybe um, it's just supposed to show how out of touch Elliot is. <laughs> I thought it was supposed to show like how the same age they were or something. Like I just don't understand. It's just like is he older or younger? I forget. He's, he's younger, younger than Christian, Christian. Okay. so he, I would say he's maybe about their age, yeah. but like, I, I don't know, no, he's probably a little older, he probably went to college. Ever so slightly older, yeah. But yeah, it's just so strange, and I don't understand why she's, why... <laughs> Let's just assume he's like 16 or something. <laughs> no! <laughs> Later, baby! He's got like a beaver mop, he's like, <laughs> hey Kate, what's up? And <laughs> it's he just comes like over on his longboard and uh, <laughs> shares with you some pop rocks. I don't know what kids do. <laughs> yeah, that's that's why he's not like he doesn't do anything with his life right now. It seems like Christian hasn't ever he's explained in construction. what he does. Oh right, he's in he's construction. In construction. Oh, okay, perfect. Meaning he's in the he's in the mafia. Yeah, yeah. Sixteen year old mob mob kid. Just like the Sopranos. <laughs> um, okay, I'm gonna move. I'm gonna move this train along. Uh, <laughs> it's all solid wood floors and red brick, and the kitchen tops are smooth concrete. Very utilitarian. Very now, like. <laughs> Very fashion, much now. It just sounds like uh, the do- the dog uh, meme. I mean, I think that you know, before that meme, we wouldn't have associated it with that. But I think "very now" is is a thing that people is that that moms say about things that are in well, the, yeah. in the style a la mode. But it's not just the very. It's that it's all solid wood floors and blah blah blah. It's very blah, very blah. Hmm. Now you see. I think that she's just, you know, cheating and doing this bullshit thing again. So talk about your next thing. <laughs> oh, okay. If I listened to my body, I'd be in Alaska by now. Uh, this is something Anastasia says when they're on the phone. Uh, or no, is that an email? It's an email. Yes, it's an email. Christian's like, just, you know, something, something. Listen to your body. It knows what it wants. And she's like, if I listened to my body, I'd be in Alaska by now. Does that mean that she wants to fuck Alaska? You mean like balls deep in Alaska? <laughs> <laughs> what she's implying here is that she wants to run away. Her body wants to run away to Alaska. But I think that she wants to run away to Alaska, like consciously. So I think she's confusing body mind here. It's a little weird. 
so this is about these are both about uh, Christian and, no sorry uh, Elliot and um, Kate Kate wait is it Elliot or is it yeah it's Elliot and Kate yeah it's Elliot and Kate it's when okay I, I was thinking of I was thinking of Kate's brother whose name also starts with the knee which is a little Ethan. weird <laughs> Ethan okay uh, <laughs> <laughs> so Elliot comes in while Kate Anna and Jose are hanging out and they start making out, and Anna says, that We are getting too uncomfortable with the unrestrained sexing unfolding in front of us. <laughs> just, just. Uh... Sexing is unfolding in front of us like a beautiful origami. <laughs> <laughs> Elliot brought like a, like a, <clears throat> a box full of kittens, and they're just like, <laughs> it's like, oh, this one's a male, this one's a female. Um, I'm yes. not comfortable and... with your binary gendering, my kittens. <laughs> Oh God! Please edit that out. Everybody's gonna scream at me. No, they won't. I think they will. We've we've gotten actual we've gotten hate mail for gender talking about no for talking about triggering. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, Someone's like, I can't believe you've fallen for that bullshit. <laughs> uh... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyway, um... all right. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, let's move on. I'm so uh, aghast. I am yeah. too. What the fuck? Grow up. Yeah. They are, and then later she says, uh, I think she goes to bed or something while Elliot's also making out with Kate again. She's, and she says, they are going to get icky. <laughs> I think they already have. And I don't know, this is just a very interesting uh, look into Anna's view of sex uh, in general, I guess. Though, I mean, I suppose you view sex very different when you're the one having it as opposed to thinking about other people having it that you are friends with and don't necessarily want to uh, envision. <laughs> yes. Here's a quote. See, baby? Easy. He grins a wide, white-toothed smile at Kate, oh. and she almost literally oh. dissolves into the couch. Uh, I'm not talking about what you think I'm talking about. Uh, <laughs> ah! Says the note. Um, it kind of sounds like he has a, a poison spitting ability. Like, when he smiles, it just like he just gleeks out a poison. And dissolves uh, his prey. <laughs> <laughs> that was it. That was all. I know we're going to mention it again, but uh, I don't care. <clears throat> one of the uh, one of the email subject lines from Christian is descriptive linguistics, and then uh, Anastasia also references it later when she's like, uh, "Descriptive linguistics is a hard limit," um, jokingly. But um, <clears throat> Anastasia says something like "rules schmules," and um, Christian's like. Shmules. Shmules. I don't think that's in Webster's uh, dictionary. dictionary. And <laughs> coupled with the descriptive linguistics subject line, what he's actually talking about, or what he's actually doing there, is prescriptive linguistics, not descriptive linguistics. What's the difference? Prescriptive linguistics is like where you believe that there are certain rules or like ways of semantic meanings, um, syntax, uh, diction, grammar rules. And descriptive linguistics is just a description of like a particular language at a at, at a point in time regardless of context and like history or like uh meaning for like words or you know rules previous rules like it's it's just a description of how a language is being used right and like i see yeah what it means to people at a particular point prescriptivism uh i was taught in my linguistics class <laughs> that prescriptivism is kind of not a good way to look at language because it is this you know it's an it's an ever evolving thing so you shouldn't rely on the dictionary to tell you what's right and wrong 75 i mean 100 percent of the time why did i say 75 yeah and actually i think webster's i think it's webster's that is actually a descriptive dictionary because that's why they update them like that's yeah. why things like literally and um oh it was another one that's why they add new words because it's actually just describing how the language is being used that's why you can add new definitions to like literally to mean figuratively because that's how people yeah. use it now. They're not actually being prescriptivist. They're not telling you how you should use it. They're telling you how people are using it. Yeah, so they're if just you saying want how to check it is. that you're it's basically to check that you're understanding how it's being used or like um, if you want to use it a particular way, it's something people understand rather than like what you should be doing. Very good descriptions. Oh, I guess I'm next. Ha. Huh. Next and last. Apartment. Beetle. Clayton's. It's all changed now. <sighs> Not going to tell you what's... I mean, you you know. You already know. Um, okay, I only have one more, and I know that I picked so much, but you need this, too. 
Sunday, he says, and the word is pregnant with an unspoken promise. Everything deep in my body uncurls and then clenches in delicious anticipation. The feeling is exquisite. Hey, uh, is the first sentence a pun because she he she's going to go get birth control? And yeah, yet, that's what I thought when I when I just saw that. But before I read the part about it being a pun, I was like, hmm. But I I feel it's a little bit of a weird. Wouldn't it be like? decidedly not pregnant with a promise well i mean i think that's it's what they're going to prevent just yeah exactly yeah. um <laughs> it's it's pregnant with paws rather than a baby <laughs> and the second sentence is just trash i mean you have the whole like oh my body did you clinch but you also have i feel like there is a problem here grammatically or mechanically but i can't remember everything deep in my body incurs and blah, 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 blah. Yeah, okay, it's a, it's like a comma splice. It, it should have just said, like, anticip- anticipation, period. The feeling is exquisite. Not comma, the feeling is exquisite. That's just taking it too far. All right, well, anyways, it's time for situational things to say. So I put myself first because I'm selfish. Okay, so the emails that they have right after he leaves, he sends her an email, which I don't like. We're going to talk about it now. Or not that I don't like, but that I'm having trouble understanding. So, this is how the sentence starts. So you felt demeaned, debased, abused, and assaulted. How very test derby field of you. I believe it was you who decided on the debasement, if I remember correctly. Do you really feel like this, or do you just think you ought to feel like this? Two very different things. If that's how you feel, do you think you could just try and embrace these feelings, deal with them? For me? That's what a submissive would do. Are you sure that a submissive would do that? I mean, I know I've said so many times before that I think a dom has a lot of responsibilities in the bedroom. And I think that part of those responsibilities is to give the submissive something they can handle first and then push the thing up to the boundary, not to start at, you know, like the top possible thing. Do you guys tend to agree with that or do you think I'm being unreasonable here? So, what, I mean, what are you saying that is going on here? Okay, I'm saying the exact bit of the sen- of that paragraph that I have a problem with is... If that's how you feel, do you think you could just try and embrace these feelings, deal with them for me? Right. That's what a submissive yeah, would do. Yeah, that, that one was really, that was really weird. I'm... <sighs> like, it's my sort of understanding that, like, a submissive will just, like, they do what they can, and they can't do any more. Yeah. I mean, they're ultimately the one who says what goes, because you can't do something they don't want <clears throat> you to do. Yeah, and I was also just thinking, like, in terms of soft limits because this seems like more of a soft limit thing like he just went too far with something she's comfortable with or comfortable ish with Mm -hmm. when you're pushing those limits it's definitely something you build up to it's not something you just do you know yeah okay he's he's been kind of a pushy jerk definitely for for sure i didn't know if that if i was maybe being wrong here no no i agree with you actually i mean i agree that she should examine her feelings and deal with them yeah but I don't think that she he needs to say that so dismissively. I think he could say something like, "We could talk about it some more." Yeah, not like not through do email. Do you think you could just deal with this? Like that's how it yeah. sounds. And then there was some other stuff too, like in these emails, like I felt sated too, more so than you could ever know. Like I, I just I feel like that feels gross <laughs> when she's emailed you and said, "Hey, that made me uncomfortable. I didn't like that. I don't know how I feel about that." Like it's one yeah. thing to say, like I enjoyed myself a lot. But then it's another thing to say that, like, <laughs> And again, I might be wrong about this. I wonder if a lot of this is just, you know, influenced by my own discomfort. But, uh, so, even though I said all that, he does say this, and I think it is true. You didn't at any time ask me to stop. You didn't use either safe word. And that is certainly true. I sort of have, like, a rebuttal for this, and I don't know if it's being nitpicky to say that they hadn't yet signed the contract, so technically the safe word usage doesn't exist, that arrangement where she can use it. Like, it's not there. Like, he just started this, so... Yeah, also, it's kind of asking a lot that she would remember that. Yeah, yeah. Because that. in a situation like that, and I mean, it's... Even if you are in a, in a relationship where, you know, you have a safe word, if you can get, like, deep into subspace and forget that there is a safe word... But they sh- they haven't even really... They've mentioned it once, and he didn't, like, remind her beforehand yeah. that she could tell him to stop. Yeah, I was just thinking, like, the way that things like this usually go is, like, right before it happens, you know, you talk through it and you say, like, if at any time and blah, 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 use your safe word. Like, that's a command. Now we're going to start. Like, that kind of thing. There's usually, like, a little yeah. spiel. Yeah. For first times like this. Okay, well, that's that was my first I think he's just point. Being, I think he's just being totally manipulative. Yep. Yeah. 
Okay, so Christian is, uh, he wakes up and he was like, oh, I slept great, whoa. And he's surprised that he slept well with Anna. Uh, this is a common trope you can t- uh, in fiction, especially fan fiction. You can tell two people are perfect for each other because they sleep well together and are fully rested. Um, I actually use this a lot in my writing just because I, I like the idea of someone being like terrible insomniac, but when they have someone to cling to, it's suddenly they can sleep well. However, in reality, I've I, I've never been able to sleep next to another person, hmm. uh, in except for one case, and that wasn't even like a person that I was in a relationship with. And just generally trying to sleep with other people is horrible, especially if you're not used to it. Yeah, if you're not used to it, it's a big deal. I have found even in the best cases where you have somebody you can like sleep in the same bed with, a lot of the times they do annoying things like take all your covers or like crush you. <laughs> yeah. But all that said, if you find somebody who's like fairly immobile while sleeping and you have a big enough space, you're you're good to go. Most people tell me I'm pretty easy to be around in that regard because I just I sort of just like stay in one spot. It's not, you know, real life doesn't really reflect these idealistic yeah. uh, things. Obviously. <laughs> Chatster. 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 Yo, James references the Icarus stuff again. I just don't think she knows any other metaphors or allusions. Yep. Uh, also, she can't. She just can't write better images. I mean, or maybe she's trying to make it an allegory. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Well, I mean, that's obviously the truth, but she could also, you know, bring other things in. She she can't get off of Tess of the D'Urbervilles, and she can't get off of the Icarus thing because she just, like, they're just so perfect in her mind. Like, there are other ways you can write these things. What would be a proper way to, like, incorporate this theme throughout the books without... Just mentioning the same phrases. Well, I mean, at the beginning of the chapter, she literally does what happens to Icarus in her dream. That's a little right. too heavy-handed for me. Um, Not I mean, okay. she just, like, if she, like, it was fine to do it once. Like, to mention yeah. the Icarus thing, because then it would just be ever-present in your mind, hopefully. Because that's hmm. sort of, you just use the situations themselves to m- sort of mimic what's going on. You usually make them more allegorical and sort of, like, how situations play out. Okay, there are so many other cool Greek Greek mythology stories, like Orpheus in the Underworld, where he has to do yeah. that weird thing, where he's like going out on his yeah. own, and has to trust, but then he doesn't trust. And yeah. it's the same yeah. with like kind of the Pillar of Salt deal with uh, yep. Sodom and Gomorrah. Like, I mean, it's, it's, <laughs> a lot of Greek mythology. <laughs> just, I'm just what? clucking like a chicken. Um, but like, or like Achilles, Achilles heel. There are many things on Earth. That's basically the, the, the. I mean, like the one of the big cornerstones of Greek mythology is like human like hubris, um, not trusting other things or not listening to other people, just sort of being too overconfident or mm-hmm. sort of taking more than you can handle. It's, it's, mm-hmm. There are like not even just like classical mythology. Um, there are more modern things she could have referenced. Like, it's not necessarily that useful, I guess. Um, because not you don't know that your audience is going to have, but you. Had, I mean, that's why she had to explain the Icarus reference because she doesn't necessarily know that everyone reading her her fan fiction is going to know who Icarus is. But she keeps doing it. I'm trying to think of what was the other thing that I mentioned. Oh yeah, the Tess of the Durbervilles thing. Like I don't know many people that have actually read Tess of the Durbervilles. So... Yeah, I, I'd never heard of it before I read this book. It's clear to me now that it was just the fucking stage play uh, <laughs> I have reference. It, I just have never read it. Um, I wouldn't read it because it's kind of fucking boring. Like I read some of it and then I got bored. I think she mentions like <laughs> the Scarlet Letter once. I did like the Scarlet Letter because I do like Nathan uh, Hawthorne. Nathaniel Hawthorne. Sorry, Na- Nathaniel. No, I'm on. I'm. We're on nickname terms, Chad. <laughs> I call him Nathan. Nate. Nate Hawthorne. Nate. <laughs> Nate Hawk. Yeah. My my, my G Nate. All right. I can track your cell phone. Remember. <laughs> That's a quote. Um. <laughs> All right, so that feels like that's in there for a more fetish reason than, like, a real thing. I think most people yeah, I think so. would just pretend that's true to PlayStation. Like, um, it's totally analogous to, like, a kidnapping situation, I think. Or, like, a like if you're doing, like, a weird, like, teacher-student or doctor-patient type thing. Like, like I'm your doctor, and I'm going to give you this medicine so you can't fight me or something. Like, you know, like, I can track your cell phone because I'm rich. Like, Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> okay, this is going to be a little bit inside- dumb ball that's but, okay um one time when i was just starting to get into this stuff this guy wanted me to do like a blackmail kind of thing with him he basically was like i will give you the numbers of people that are important in my life that this would ruin me basically and you will hold that over me 
and it was like real like he gave me their numbers wow i was like i don't what do i do with this I'm not sure how I would handle that now, like, I, but it was definitely something where, like, you know, s- some people w- would definitely really like that. Yeah, I think to so be too. like a real thing where they could be found at any time where someone could track their cell phone. But then it's kind of like a trust play thing. Definitely, yeah. uh, which I don't think they're. I don't think they're there yet. Yeah, I don't think so either. I did not stick around with that blackmail thing just because it was a lot of uh, responsibility. Yeah, it's probably a lot of work. <laughs> yeah, and I didn't, I didn't really like the guy. Oh. Huh. But I never do. Uh, the upside is that you can just trick them and threaten them all the time, but then, you know, that piece of paper with all the numbers just throw it away. Yeah. <laughs> or just remember the names and be like, I'm going to call Casey or whatever. Casey. I'm going to call right. Clarice. Anna, this is Anna's internal monologue. He leans down and nuzzles my ear with his nose, like horse. Um, that's Christian. Christian doing that, leaning down with his nose, nuzzling, nuzzling ear. Uh, 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 nuzzling ear with nose. Uh, okay. <clears throat> <laughs> okay, that's it. That's finished. Let's go. I don't want someone to write you an email saying something mean to you. That's something... I don't know. People do that. That's all. What? Yeah, people do that. What are you talking about? Not the Why ear with that? the nose. That's a little bit weird. And it does. It is reminiscent of a horse. But like... I wasn't saying that's not a thing people do. I'm what are you just... saying is going to happen? No, no. <laughs> I'm not. It's not like a threat. Like, like this is going to happen to you if you say this. But just like, you are know... Are you blackmailing me? Is this yes. Is this happening? No, I will say that nuzzling is is very much a thing in fiction and role playing. Lots of BDSM things. Too. Yeah, it is a little bit dorky to write it out like that, but maybe the, it happens. Really. It's just the particular way that she wrote it that makes it sound yeah. like a horse. Like to tie back into all of the horse stuff we were talking about earlier, where <laughs> I just imagine like Anastasia like at a stable and the horse like she's like, she's developed this close bond with her horse and the horse leans down and nuzzles her ear with its snout. A little snoot. His little snoot. <sighs> You guys, I, no, I want to say this, even though it's the most embarrassing thing I've ever said. Okay. okay. So there are, like, these the series of books, they're, they're called, like, Pony Pals. And it's basically about, uh, it's sort of like the Babysitter's Club. I feel like I read with, Pony Pals. It's, like, for young girls, and it's about, it's about girls who have horses, and they, you know, they have to live the dream of being little girls with, with ponies. Mm-hmm. I tried to, like, write a parody of that, but with, like, pony play. Ooh. So it was in the same, like, diction, like, really kind of dumbed down for the simplistic sentences yeah. and stuff. It, it didn't work out. <laughs> um, but <laughs> there would be a lot of nuzzling in that. Yeah, there sure would. <laughs> Someday I'd like to try again, maybe. Yeah, that's really funny uh, concept. So Christian insists that Taylor, quote, take care of the beetle. Anna realizes that Jose will be devastated why didn't she just give it the beetle back to Jose or something? Would that be or would that be weird if she did that? It seems like it would be the most appropriate since he got it from her and he was like, "I've got this new car now." I mm, I don't know. I mean, they would eventually have to get rid of it anyway. I think it it might have just been that she was trying to avoid a confrontation between Jose and Christian, not mentioning much about either of them to the other. Also, the only thing Anna has in the Beetle is a flashlight. Mm. That's all it's a... that she takes out of the car. Is that possible? No. I keep my car like pretty empty, but I still have like a toolkit and music and all my reusable shopping bags and what stuff. What about like the registration? Well, I mean, I'm assuming that they're gonna just where if he sells the car, they're gonna have the registration anyway. And insurance. She would need her insurance. Well, why would she? she yeah. Wouldn't take it out. Yeah, she would take her insurance out, but her her insurance card is probably on her. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, a toolkit would make sense, but no music because I think this is a pretty old car and it doesn't sound like it's ever been updated. Still, I feel like she might have a, a cassette cassette tape. In it's there. from like the '60s or '70s. Um, yeah, that's true. It doesn't even have power steering. Uh, <clears throat> probably doesn't have. It probably doesn't have anti-lock brakes either. She probably has to pump her brakes all Oof. the time. I mean, she doesn't have anything in her possession, so maybe she just doesn't have anything in her car either. She likes music, sort of. <laughs> she likes one band. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I think it would make more sense for her to give the car back to Jose, but I think E.L. James, one, probably didn't think of that or did and just discarded it uh, because she just wanted Christian to flaunt his like power a bit by having Taylor just quote-unquote dispose of the car somehow. The end. Kate and I are in the kitchen when there's a knock at the door. Taylor stands on the porch looking immaculate in his suit. I noticed the trace of X uh, blah 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 trim for seek in his cool chair. Uh, I don't understand why E.L. James would write in someone like Taylor when Christian is there to compare him with. Does that make sense? 
Because in comparison to Christian, he seems like a lot cooler and more reliable of a guy. Why are there any other men in this book? Why are there more than two characters? Oh my god, that's not what I meant. (laughs) But if you want to make your character seem cool... Why wouldn't... Why aren't we following Kate? I mean, okay, you're think you're obviously thinking of Chris Evans, but I fucking am not. <laughs> yes, you are. Look, Taylor does not look like many of the things that Chris Evans looks like. A beautiful bitch. He's had a buzz cut in some no, uh, no. movies. Not in not not in the movie that I like him in best. <laughs> I only like him in the one movie. That's the weird thing about Chris Evans. Oh, like, okay. All the other ones, are whatever. But as as soon as you get to Captain America, it's different. <laughs> Well, now, it, it would not be a lie to say that my own personal tastes have come in to play here. Okay, sorry. I mean, I think I think that he's just supposed to be like a stern Secret Service type of guy. Well, maybe I, maybe that's... And, I, maybe and that's... like the buzz cut is like, no fucking nonsense. I'm here to do my goddamn job. Right, he wouldn't be playing all these weird games. Like, if, like it, just imagine if Taylor... <laughs> I'm about to say something I hate myself for saying if if taylor was you know because like when you think of a dom you think of somebody who is like controlled like that is probably right. the thing that is the best is like someone you can trust he comes mm-hmm. across as someone you can trust christian doesn't come across imagine as if that. he was taylor swift <laughs> <laughs> um i think it's i mean you know christian is like he's edward so he's you know got messy hair and and yeah he's like very like oh passionate He's cooler and like you know moody and stuff like that. I mean, it's I think it's just that kind of contrast. Moody man, don't turn me on. Don't want a moody man. Well, my point was that I think when you have somebody who's clearly he doesn't have any personality, in my opinion. He I basically more imagine desirable. Him, he just goes home and lies down and stares at his ceiling for like yeah. the rest of the day when he's done with work. He doesn't even. Sleep. I gotta say that does kind of appeal to me. <laughs> he doesn't, just because I doesn't even sleep. I love robots. Yeah, that's true. Uh, I like it when people are uncomplicated. Anyways, let's just move on. I, I, I'm not saying that I don't uh, dislike non or uncomplicated people either, but he doesn't have any personality based on the way he's written. You're sort of putting yeah, a lot well, on Yeah, well, not yet. End. You know, I did I did read all the books, Chad. We haven't gotten there So yet. maybe I know things that you don't. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you learn more about Taylor that make him seem like a normal person, a sympathetic person. Not saying that he's, like, the best written guy in history, obviously. <clears throat> this is in another email. Uh, Anastasia writes, I only wish I was more experienced and therefore more prepared. But I don't know that being more experienced in just, like, vanilla stuff would really make her more prepared. That's sort of the point of, of like, easing her into things. And for a lot of regular people, it's probably not something they've really thought too much about. So... There's probably a lot of exoticism and like mystique and stuff to clear away um, that would sort of complicate things if you just dove right in without any... Yeah. Well, I mean, she's done some research or something, maybe. She looked at Wikipedia for an hour or something. Who knows? Half an hour. (laughs) She didn't even (laughs) look at any videos. Maybe it would just, you know, give her some sort of baseline to be more experienced. Yeah. That's really what she's saying here. Like, she's just saying, like, I've never done anything. So, but... She's. I think she's conflating that with like experienced being like ready for everything, which yeah, isn't that, necessarily yeah. true. Yeah, yeah. That not even just for like uh, like sexuality, things related to sex and sexuality, just in general, having a lot of experience doesn't necessarily prepare you for everything. Yeah. She might. I guess. I, mean, it might, I guess what she's really might trying make to you... say. Yeah. What she's trying to say, she might be have more like emotional reserves or like more resilience to fall yeah. back on. But that's not or just really be happen. more prepared to accept new things. Yeah, yeah. So maybe I'm just wrong. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I'm, you know, it's a fucking book. Uh, so Christian gives Anna a Blackberry. This obviously takes place in that weird in-between time. Well, traditional phones are still around, uh, but smartphones were not there yet. Blackberries, they don't have those anymore, right? They do. They do. Okay, what do they, are they, I mean, do, do they, are they They're smartphones, the same? No. Let's see, Rim, the company that used to make BlackBerry, uh, renamed itself to BlackBerry uh, because they were losing so much market share. They make uh, touch devices now. They actually look pretty oh, okay. nice. Um, they're on a bunch of different carriers. Yeah, I was pretty sure that they still did something. But So I'm assuming that this is like this, the old style with like kind of fat and lots of little tiny key, uh, yeah. physical keyboard. Yeah. Those are st- and a little bit of screen. For some businesses, those are still the de facto work phone because they're taking a long time to update. 
the big problem is that there's some security issues with them. Like they're not as reliable, and since they're old, they're they were pretty they're pretty reliable. But did they do any? I mean, they, were they cell phones? Yeah. Yeah. Because it sounds sort of like they're basically just full keyboard cell phones. That that also do email. They do email. They have web browsers. Um, okay. Yeah, but it's it's like <laughs> I'm 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 thinking of like when they first came out. Yeah, that's what that's I'm thinking. Obviously... I don't think she's talking about that old. Black yeah, model. definitely not. I haven't kept up with anything <laughs> since then. So yeah, Anna doesn't answer her phone, or like she's missed a whole bunch of calls again. Like she just didn't bring her phone to work. I guess. No, no. Um, well, maybe because she misses. But the, I guess those calls all take place after she gets home from work. She doesn't answer her phone, but, like, she doesn't have her... F- I mean, her phone is, like, always on silent, I guess. Well, she says when she first gets it, it's on vibrate, because it, like, vibrates against her butt. She's like, no, I'm not going to answer The Blackberry that. is, but I, th- I thought when she was checking her missed calls, she was checking her old cell phone. She was. <laughs> the, Blackberry, the Blackberry was given to her exclusively for email. Like, that's that's what it sounds oh like. Oh, my God. Yeah, that's yep. what I was asking. That's what I was yeah, saying. Oh, my that's, fucking that's God. That's how we're going to be used. Like, you're right about that. She's going to be... Christian's going to call and text her on her regular... F- her, her, her older phone, and then when, <laughs> when it's email time... The Blackberry. <laughs> How's that real? I can't believe she's this. just gonna, she's gonna have like all this fucking shit. Someday she's gonna get a smartphone and she's gonna be able to consolidate her iPod and her Blackberry and her cell phone and her computer. She'll only use her iPhone or like smartphone for the phone call part, and then she'll still yeah. have her old flip phone for. Uh, this is making me sick. For texting. This is making me and ill. She'll carry it around. Like I can't, I can't figure out like where does she use her cell phone? She never seems to have it with her and as my as my father would often angrily say to my mother there's no point in having a cell phone if you're not going to take it out of the house with you i think she has an honor she just doesn't ever use it for anything because she's not friends with anybody other than kate i think that's basically it she didn't really text people before christian i think um and she just like all she, the only people she calls are ray her mother and then maybe kate if something's up maybe Can't. jose I can't that. believe this shit. <laughs> Based on the way that this book is played out, like it sort of sounds like she's friends with Jose, but not. She's more like acquainted with Jose. They're not like really good friends. Like it sounds mm. like. Well, I think no, the, I disagree. the book tries to make them sound like good friends, but I also disagree. Yeah. They are arm in arm and hanging out all the time, and and, he and they've known each other since car. they were young or something. I think. I think. I think they oh, just. Right. Uh, right. They were like childhood friends. That's right. Uh, I don't know about that. Oh, okay. I think they might just be friends from. No, I don't know actually. But the dads know right. each other. Yeah, that's true. But yeah, yeah, yeah of course. Then yeah, okay. But the, the, wasn't that something that they found out later? That it was like once they met, they realized that their dads had known each other. I think. Yeah, I think that might be the case. I'm I'm confusing with Twilight with this. Because <laughs> in Twilight, they did they didn't know each other. Uh, like, because she was new. No, no, but they knew each other their whole life. Oh, they yes. did? Yeah, they used to make mud pies oh, together. Whatever. Duh. I didn't fucking read Twilight. Uh, neither did I. I just watched the movie, but still. I, knew. I haven't seen the movie either. Okay, well, anyway. They are anyway. good friends in this. He's like, oh, I love Jose so much. He's so great. I think James just isn't portraying that correctly. Probably. And speaking of Jose, it's just more Jose. God, he's so uncomplicated. I hadn't really appreciated that before. I feel like she says almost this exact same thing. She does. Earlier in the book. I think she does. She definitely does. We definitely said it. It was like it's when they had that ominous coffee meeting, and he like, <laughs> I just I just like how I can just stay with somebody who's so uncomplicated. <laughs> I think that you've appreciated it before. He grabs his stuff from my side table and his shoes, which he doesn't put on. Taylor will come and sort your beetle. I was serious. Don't drive it. I'll see you at my place on Sunday. I'll email you a time. And like a whirlwind, he's gone. Uh, (laughs) Christian turns into a whirlwind. Or maybe he's just like a whirlwind. But that made me think maybe he has more powers than merely being a concrete elemental. Go ahead. Sorry. He's the Tasmanian Maybe Maybe Anna's Pidgey blew him away. But the real reason I brought this up was a pothole. Because his shoes, which he doesn't put on, at no point does he put his shoes back on. Or does he? I mean, why would she... I mean, he grabs his shoes. Why wouldn't he... What's he gonna do? What's he gonna do? So... He needs to put the shoes on. I just, I felt like it was so stupid. It was such a stupid detail. <laughs> I think she just skipped over it. Like, why? she skips over him taking the condom off every why time. Why even mention? she thinks it's gross. Why even mention it? <laughs> I think he put him on at the um, door. 
yeah, they drink beer with Jose, and then, you know, once again, champagne from Christian. Can really get more obvious what they're doing mm-hmm. here. Mm-hmm. Every, everyone's an alcohol. What's Taylor? Tequila. No, probably not. Probably... No, he's probably like, um... He's probably like a domestic beer. Vermouth or something. Yeah, I agree. Jose is probably Jose Cuervo. Oh, what's, uh... I can't think of any other characters. Kate? Kate is red wine. Kate's red wine. Yeah. Um, That's true. Yeah. Uh, beer, probably. Maybe like. He seems like a whiskey drinker to me. <laughs> it w- yeah, maybe. A hot toddy is raised drink. Like tea. He just drinks like. Yeah, exactly. Tea. <laughs> yeah. Twisted tea. We talked about this earlier. Charles, you're breaking up like crazy. Nobody has heard you for the last Uh-oh. minute or so. I'm sorry. Yeah. Call has drops. Call has drops. Call has drops. Call has drops. Let me join the call. Everything's offline. Hope they don't mind. Cause <laughs> I should shut up. I'll Skype connects me back to the thing. Help me, help me, help me. Please put me back in the call. I wanna be in the call. Let me call. I wanna be online. It looks like I can almost be online if I just wait a second. Still doing the thing. Let me be online. <sighs> so the next thing, um, we t- we mentioned this earlier. Apartment Beetle Clayton's. It's all changed now. And then later she says, "New city, no job, nut job, boyfriend." This is kind of like everything Anna is comfortable with is gone. Her apartment her car, her job at Clayton's, Kate's leaving, she's got this new unstable boyfriend, no job. There's like a lot of stripping of just comfort here, and that's really interesting to me because it probably makes her a lot more manipul- manipulative. Uh, she doesn't, she's disoriented, she doesn't know what's going on. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure that's not quite what was intended, but it definitely just feels like that's kind of what's going on. Yeah. I think you're probably right. Loss of all these things that she. I think part, the other the other big thing is that she's like now next to Christian. Exactly. Yeah, yeah and her nut job boyfriend. She's right. She's right there. She's in the new city. Yeah. Like the new city just happens very, to be her. very accessible, and yeah. uh, she doesn't have anyone to lean on really because Kate's about to leave. And also, she has fallen into a situation where it doesn't matter that she doesn't have a job right now because her apartment is totally paid for. So. I had I I put in a little more things of this than I was supposed to, but there was okay. a lot in this chapter. And it goes to her doctor's appointment slash date in high heels and a fancy dress. I said, she's also going over to get fucked, so that made sense to me. Okay, but I don't know, I feel like it's the it's like morning, isn't it? It's Yeah, it's like it's, or, it's 10 like ten or eleven. Early afternoon maybe. Twelve fifty five precisely. It's not even afternoon. It's just afternoon. I don't the doctor's appointment is actually just an addition to what was supposed to happen on Sunday. Um, yeah, that's he what, tacked I, that on, that's what I'm feeling. Like he, he gave her the choice. No, he... Yeah, I, where they had a date to meet on Sunday, and then he also wanted her to get contraception. And like, no, he she said she wanted to have the doctor's appointment at his place on Sunday so that she could guarantee that she would get to see him on Sunday. Hmm, maybe you're right. I forget now. <laughs> Yeah, you're probably right. Yeah, I talked about this uh, last chapter, and I was like, "Why is she? Why is she doing this? She's she wants to see her. Maybe she just wants to look nice." But I don't know. It's weird to like go with the doctor and I, I even find go it to the doctor in a fancy dress, even if the doctor is coming to you. I feel like I don't know. It's weird. I would just go to the doctor in a normal dress. Elliot mounts their TV onto the wall, and the girls are quote impressed by his prowess with the power drill. I thought, like, Anna would know something about doing this kind of thing since she worked at a hardware store, but I guess that's not necessarily the case. I mean, they don't hire people at, like, GameStop based on their (laughs) game knowledge. They just hire them on whether they can sell shit. So I guess it's not... But I... I, She says she knows the difference between a hawk and a handsaw, so I would hope she would be at least a little independent in that area. Yeah, one would think. She knows the difference, not the application, apparently. True. I actually had... A different interpretation about this scene. Here's a line. The line. Kate and I flop on the couch giggling, impressed by his prowess with a power drill. I mean, that kind of sounds like a threesome metaphor. Like, like yeah. he can drill both of us at once. Hmm. <laughs> oh, yeah, I like it. <laughs> or something. And then there's also the bit about him mounting the TV on the wall. I just don't know. It's just, it sounds a little He's bit... just humping it. 
Yes. Uh-huh. Kate chat. Kate chat. Anna and Kate talk very little about the car. Like, she says, what's that? And Anna's like, it's a car. And then they're like, he sure is rich and ostentatious or something. And then that's it. That rich they go fucker. inside. Yeah. They don't, like, look at it or anything or check it out or, like count the cup holders or anything i mean maybe kate is just so rich and like she used to getting new cars all the time that she's not impressed but i don't know i would be like well let me see your cool new fucking audi that's a yeah. fancy car you want to look at it Let's check, check it yeah, it's a hatchback take it for a spin <laughs> no one gives a check shit. the interiors <laughs> <laughs> well i mean i think at least i think at least anna would probably want to do that she'd be like check out my car but i also think she's sort of pissed off that christian gave it to her so maybe she just is yeah like, Let's definitely get away from here yeah, probably still dealing with it. She suddenly, she's like becoming surrounded by reminders of Christian uh, and his like wealth. So perhaps she's starting to resent it. That's another thing. Going back to the stripping away of all the comfort, like he, she's now like got all the stuff that is his, and she's kind of like indebted to him, I guess. Yeah, he's giving her all this stuff, and it's all his stuff now. Like she doesn't really have much else of her own if she's going to replace her phone with the BlackBerry. Anyway. Kate's parents have gotten them a converted warehouse apartment overlooking Pike's Place Market itself. Just the most Seattle location yeah. that she could think of. <laughs> That's yeah. where they are. Right right, right in the middle of it. I wonder how much it costs, because it seems like it would cost a whole fucking lot. Yeah, well. I always wonder about what kind of people can afford places like that like right downtown and like is it all just like trust fund kids? Yeah. Just living the dream? Yeah. A lot of it is, I think. Uh, the, but then also sometimes trust when kids buy the cheapest apartments possible. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's the smart thing to do. <clears throat> the smart thing to do is not to live in an expensive city. <laughs> yeah, of course. Like if you're if you're like really really money conscious, but I mean if you want to live in a city, then you just have to fucking deal with it, which sucks. I always like cannot fathom that when these gigantic condo places go up downtown, like I can't imagine that there are enough people who make enough money to afford those places. But I guess there are. It's just so mind boggling to me. Yeah. <laughs> that, yeah, that's interesting about like some cities like um like New York, where in New York it's just because so many people want to live there. But you get other places mm-hmm. like um people don't want to commute to New York from like Philadelphia. Um so they buy cheaper condos that are still expensive by the standards of living in that city to commute to a different place. Or, like, I'm trying to think of other places that happens. That happens in Chicago, too. Um, sometimes, like, when the housing market crashes, that stuff gets really cheap because <laughs> nobody wants them. Hmm. So you can keep just an eye open. buy a cheap condo in, like, Chicago <laughs> or New York because uh, no one can afford it. The delivery boy is immediately blown away by Kate's hotness and hair pile. Um, let me read the exact quote. Because hair pile might be a little bit misleading. Kate buzzes the delivery boy in. His mouth falls open when he sees Kate, all tight jeans, t-shirt, and hair piled high with escaping tendrils. She has that effect on men. We've already established this. And I was wondering, (laughs) how would someone delivering champagne hide their boner in it, like in porn, when they put their boner in a box or in a pizza? Um, Okay, so I'm assuming that the champagne is inside of a bag. So what he should do is take out the bag. bag. Or not bag, but you know, like a paper Thing. Like, you know, that kind of a shit. No, because he drove over. It's not like a room service thing. I guess, but... All right. uh, I mean, yeah, okay, it could be an icy bucket. Maybe it's an icy I bucket. Mean, uh, well, you just put the icy bucket in front of your, uh, your, your business. It's just detached and inside the bottle. <laughs> yeah, that's actually what I was feeling. <laughs> just floating, like, like some sort of horrible metaphor. Do a complicated like a yoga pose, and she'll yeah. be so distracted that she won't notice the boner. <laughs> just come in a costume. Just dresses a giant champagne bottle. Uh, here's the big one. He worries me, Anna. At least it's a good champagne and it's chilled. Kate, get thee to the trash zone. You're getting to be a worse friend as the days go. Yeah, there's, this is completely inexcusable. Uh, so many anger words I have. Uh, the whole lines, just to give you an idea of how bad she's being. Know. Are Are you going to be okay while I'm away? Of course, I answer reassuringly. New city, no job, not job boyfriend. Did you give him our address? No, but stalking is one of his specialties, Anastasia muses, matter-of-factly. Kate's brown hits further. Somehow I'm not surprised. He worries me, Anna. At least it's good champagne, and it's chilled. (laughs) Why would you say that? She just said that he's basically a stalker. Yep, it's just the worst. Come on, Kate. (laughs) She's very easily distracted. It's just so bad. (laughs) And soon, Neil James won't have to think of... of, uh, Oh, boy. Call again. Dropped from the call again. What a mess. What a fucking mess. What a fucking, what a motherfucking mess.
Yes. It worked. Hello? Hello? It worked. Hi. Hello? Hi. Okay. Should we go move on to Goddess? We already talked about the dissolving. Yeah. Or do we want to talk about this some more? No. Okay. Uh, Kate dissolved. Uh, like, I'm assuming this is, she's still in her melted form. That's sort of how I'm picturing her throughout the rest of the book, uh, since she melted. <laughs> so now she's finally wandered into some solution and dissolved. So, or she wandered into something that has turned into a solution. Um, Goddess chat. Goddess chat. So the subconscious is finally doing something nice. I mean, she's a little bit naggy later, but but when the Claytons kind of see Anastasia off and she hugs them, her subconscious is, is in awe. And I can only imagine that's like a happy feeling. I don't know if that's the self-conscious is doing. <laughs> no, no, it's just a reaction or whatever. Yeah, I, I mean, I guess it's just her not being a bitch about it. Right. It's good. It's nice. Like she's, sure. she's, she's realizing that there are other things in life than being angry. I don't think the subconscious is doing anything nice. <laughs> she's like amazed that Anna's holding herself together. That doesn't seem like a nice thing to me. Yeah, she's kind like, of. She's like, wow, good job. <laughs> it's not a sarcastic awe. It's a true awe. So I don't think that's like a... I don't know. That's not I don't like know. an insult. I don't know. I mean, the fact that she's in awe that Anna's like emotionally held together here, that doesn't read as nice to me. But it's like the, the, her subconscious considers her weak. That's what I'm saying. Like... I'm sure she's fervently agreeing with me right now. Um, I can hear you talking about me. <laughs> Sorry. Well, we can't hear you, yeah. so what else are we going to do? Anna has like a tiny like residual little feeling about what happened with Jose, but she says it has been swept under the rug, the rug on which the goddess is sitting, eating grapes while she, while she waits impatiently to meet Christian. And it's a weird image of uh, the goddess... Just sitting on top of someone's feelings, being kind of real smug about it. Kind of a, maybe a little bit, kind of a cuckold thing going on. Not really cuckold, but just sort of lording over like, I know that you like me, but I don't like you, so I hold the power right here. Yeah, I see that. There's more stuff about the subconscious. You should really be unpacking these, my subconscious nags, pushing her, or pursing her harpy lips together. No, today's the day! My inner goddess is beside herself, hopping from foot to foot. So... The goddess is superseding the subconscious, but not in a way that is exceptionally violent. I hope that there is just like an all-out mud wrestling match <laughs> between the subconscious and the inner goddess. That's not mud. <laughs> just flopping around in her brains. <laughs> Go, girl! My inner goddess has her pom-poms at hand. She's in cheerleading mode. Also, she's from the 90s. <laughs> yeah, go, girl! I was bored of this. I was bored of this. I was bored of all this subconscious goddess stuff. I really think that the threat level should just be at normal. Normal threat level. Okay. The, <laughs> Which is what? The, the color I've decided is boring, cloudy day gray. <laughs> All right. Or in other words, normal Seattle weather gray. I was, yeah, I gotta <laughs> say something like that too. But no, boring, cloudy day gray. Typical Seattle gray day. Gray day. <laughs> day gray. No offense, Seattle. No offense. It's just how it is. Favorite line. Mine is, ready for some contraception? He asks as he stands and, and holds his hand out to me. Y'all ready for contraception? Dun 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 dun. <laughs> yeah, it's mine as well. It it really makes uh, contraception sound like appetizers or hors d'oeuvres. <laughs> ready for some contraception? Vader just <laughs> brings out like a platter of condoms or give this one a try. It has an hands. excellent flavor. <laughs> <laughs> there were there were people um when I went to school, someone I knew had a radio show and on it they tried a bunch of flavored condoms for oral sex just for fun and they were all they were they just like were like these are all terrible <laughs> that was their yeah they are they are often very bad <laughs> they are almost never oh, man. no way around it <laughs> that reminds me of this time when i was in high school and there was this really cute guy and i was uh in my phase of of exerting my dom dominance my dominus with, without having a, a healthy outlet and i was just like this guy was complaining that he was really hungry, and I was just like harassing him to eat this pina colada flavored lube. <laughs> <laughs> I just like do it? would not leave him alone. Yeah, he did eventually. <laughs> what was his determination on the? I mean, I I tried it as well. It was just kind of candy. T- I mean, lube is is lube. It, I mean, and if it's flavored lube, it's it's it just tastes like candy. Yeah, nasty um, candy. Yeah. <laughs> okay, and so right after that line. He says, or Anna says, you're not going to come as well, are you? I gasp, shocked. He laughs. I'd pay very good money to watch, believe me, Anastasia, but I don't think the good doctor will approve. Does, does he mean he's going to watch her pelvic exam? Is that what's 
going on? Is that what he wants to pay money to watch? Or is he just like want to know everything about her and like they're not actually going to do a pelvic exam and it's going to be just questions and I don't know, blood pressure checking or something? Why does he want to pay so much money to see this? What's what? This is especially confusing considering one of the like hard limits in the contract. Yeah, yeah the exactly. medical thing. Yeah. No gynecological instruments. <laughs> I think that's what he's saying, though. Like, I think he's saying, like, I want to watch, like, a full pelvic exam. Not sexy at all. To some people, maybe, I guess, but... mm. What was good? I think I may be the only person with one of these. Yep. And mine is is pretty, uh, is pretty, uh, unrelated. (laughs) She says, she's, when she wakes up on the day of her pelvic exam, she says, my inner goddess is beside herself, hopping from foot to foot. Anticipation hangs heavy and pretentious above my head like a dark tropical storm cloud. Butterflies flood my belly, as well as a darker, carnal, captivating ache, as I try to imagine what he will do to me. Uh, I like to imagine this literally just like a very strange image of supernatural divine kind of thing and it reminds me of a line from the film Even Cowgirls Get the Blues starring Edmund Thurman screenplay by Gus Van Zandt based on the book by Tom Robbins in which Lorraine Bracco's character says Nuet Tukame, the mother goddess, came to me on the back of a doe, hummingbird sipping the tears she was shedding. I don't know, it's just a, it's, that's just like where my mind went when I was imagining this image of Anna with butterflies in her belly and a dark cloud over her head. Yeah, it was very, <laughs> very symbolic seeming. Uh, safe word. Safe word. My safe word is the length of this chapter and the, just the way it was structured was bad. But actually... Chad's safe word is my safe word, so he can read that when it's his turn. But also, remember this voicemail I read a couple chapters ago? I read it a couple chapters ago in the spoiler dungeon. I think you need to learn to manage my expectations. I'm not a patient man. If you say you are going to contact me when you finish work, then you should have the decency to do so. Otherwise, I worry, and it's not an emotion I'm familiar with. I don't tolerate it very well. Call me. It's just like gross. Wait, isn't that from this chapter? It is from this chapter, but I read it a couple chapters ago as a spoiler dungeon thing. Oh, I see. It's just like a creepy... I don't, I don't, yeah, I don't definitely. like that. Okay. <laughs> the email subject lines, I paid attention to them this time because they were different almost every single time. You know, it's just more silly stuff that people don't do, making a, a new subject line for every email. But uh, I'm going to read them all. Assault and battery, the after effects. Free your mind. Consenting adults... You didn't call the cops. Stalker. Stalker, me. Expensive charlatans. Sect opinions. Shouty capitals! Descriptive linguistics. Challenging but amusing young women. Blackberry. Alone! Consumerism gone mad. Sagacity for one so young. Where are you? My life in numbers. An excellent vintage. Envy. That's kind of the, basically the whole book. It got a little off the rails when they were just talking about blackberries and, and shit at the end there, but definitely some, some, the stuff about, you know, you didn't call the cops, I'm not a stalker, free your mind, that kind of thing. Very, yeah. Just the, very much in a nutshell, what's going on in this book. That free your mind thing really makes him sound like the worst kind of internet person. Like a, like a new age <laughs> predator. A predator that does tarot. Invisible Predator, stalking Arnold Schwarzenegger. He just wants to give them all readings. <laughs> Wait, guys, let me tell you he about He can crystals. see their heat signature and their aura. <laughs> oh, no. So Christian's emails are really pushy. Um, he does a lot of I, what I feel is like subtle manipulation, and he pushes Anna around a lot, considering that she seems sort of shaken up about like what they just did, and he didn't really like do anything to help her through it. Um, and he tries to like invalidate Anna's feelings uh, about like their first incorporation of... Like corporal punishment in the bedroom and he tries to basically just circumvent that completely by asking Anna to just deal with it for his sake he's not willing to help her through it or like you know introspect about it he's just like get over it or like embrace it for me and he says like to her like that's what a submissive would do but Anna doesn't know anything about really that much about the situation so he could just be saying that like she doesn't know if that's really true um I mean she can assume it for reasons but she's basically just having to take christian's word for it and he pretty much says that he he sort of says that that's what he's doing he's like i'm grateful for your experience i value it and i'm only beginning to understand what it means simply put it means that you are mine in every way yep that really creeps me out yeah i found that extremely creepy he's basically saying like 
you don't know what you're doing, so I can do whatever the fuck I want. It's horrendous. No yeah. way for you to argue with me because I can just say that's how it is and she won't disagree. Then that's how he's thinking of it. And that's not to say that that's how it's going to go. But uh, he asks her earlier in an email, like, is that how you really feel? Or do you think that's just how you should feel? That's a, that's a paraphrase. Um, and that's a really, that's sort of a fucked up question. Like, it, if, she, if he were... If they were like together talking talking this through, that could be a valid question. But he's using it to push her around. He's like asking, like, "Oh, this is just how you think you should feel because that's how you've been, you know, society's taught you to feel." And he's get, he's just it's disingenuous. He's doing it to get his way. How would she know to differentiate between those two things at this point? She doesn't have any of that experience, so her feeling the way that she does about how things went is valid because that's how she feels. Like. Yep. She's not tricking herself into thinking that. How could she do that? And Christian's trying to invalidate that. He's like, no, that's, no, that's just, that's, no. You're just, you just are thinking wrong. That's what essentially what he's telling her. Like, you're thinking about this the wrong way. He says, like, you need to free your mind and listen to your body. Which, I mean, in a more healthy context, sure. That's a, that's yeah. a perfectly valid thing to say. If you're really working with somebody about, uh, you know, getting into this lifestyle or just trying something new for their own good... Or for their own, like, you know, curiosity. That's not what he's doing here. So that's that's basically my safe word. Hmm. Yep. And all the Jose stuff? Uh, yep, and then all the Jose stuff. Because uh, Anna's... Jose's still around, and Anna's still sort of treating it like it's not a big deal. And she's still proceeding the way that she normally would. Which, I mean, given, I guess, the context of their relationship, I, I could understand. But she sort of has not ever really dealt with what happened. So... Yep. That's that's all for me. Okay, okay, time for the spoiler dungeon. Okay, so two things mentioned in this podcast: the photos, because Terry Doom said something like, "Oh, I bet he reblogs all those black and white photos. I bet he doesn't take pictures." Well, he does. He takes pictures. <laughs> Anastasia finds them later. I don't remember if it's in this book or the second one, but she finds them. I seem to remember reading a quote. I think it was from the Fifty Shades of Grey quote Tumblr where this person is just reading Fifty Shades of Grey and highlighting weird passages and commenting on them. It's 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 very funny. It's I detonate around him dot tumblr dot com. The other thing, Christian is well rested in this chapter. He's surprised because he has very bad nightmares most of the time. Just to let you know that this is stupid. More <laughs> stupid than you can imagine. Does Anna name the Audi? I don't think she does. Does Jose find out about what happened to the car? I don't remember, but I don't think that it comes up. All right, well, that's Bye, it. Bye, everybody. Laters, baby. Am I still the only one doing this? Laters, baby. <laughs> no, laters, baby. <laughs>